book of Hebrews, the second chapter. We'll begin reading in verse number one and look down through those first four verses this morning. I've entitled this little section, Drift. Have you ever been sitting in a, maybe here in this place, or hopefully not, and your mind just kind of drift into something else, or thinking about where you're going to be, or what you're going to do, and what's going on in front of you kind of fades off, and you're looking, but you're not seeing, you're kind of drifted off into space. Uh, those of us who have ever taught a class realize that most of the time, when we're standing in front of people, unless we do something really remarkable, our minds are capable of doing many things at the same time. And people drift. They drift into other areas while they're sitting there listening, even right now as they're listening to me. And as we look at the things of God, as we look at the things of the Word, we find out that it's very, very important that we pay attention. There's a preacher that's on television, Virginia, and I got to go to his church in Atlanta, Georgia, and there's a little catchphrase that he says hundreds of times throughout one of his messages, and it's the word, listen. And he'll be talking along and he'll say, now listen, or listen. And it's because we know that while we're standing here talking to people that they might be hearing, but they're not listening. That is drift. I remember when I was a young kid growing up outside of Detroit, my dad always had a boat. And when we would go fishing, there were times that we would anchor. And there was times that we made sure that we didn't anchor. We wanted to kind of flow with the current. This morning, I want to talk about not drifting, but the penalty of drifting or paying attention and listening and taking in what God wants us to have. To know the truth is not enough. Just to know the truth about God and about Christ is not enough. The devil himself knows more about God than any of us. And yet, he's going to find himself in an eternity without God. To know the truth is not enough. You have to act upon what we know to be true. And to fail to act on what we know to be true is really to reject the truthfulness of the word. You see, hell is filled with people who never actively oppose Jesus Christ. They just simply neglected to respond to what they know is true. If you are such a person this morning, then this message is specifically for you. Some people have said, Don, do you, did you make these messages for, for particular people? No, I quit doing that a long time ago because you went all week long on how to work on a message and make it flow and all the illustration and all the points, and, and then that person doesn't show up. And then you have to say, well, what was the purpose of all that? And so, no. You see, in, in the little methodology or the style that I, I've come along to, to grab onto is we take a book or a passage of Scripture and we go through it normally paragraph by paragraph. And so whatever is in that paragraph is what you get today. And so if you say, well, Don, you made that message just for me. No, that's not true. The Holy Spirit made that message just for you today. And so I can't be accused of singling out individuals, but this morning, if you've never responded to the truth, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you're going to find this message is specifically for you. In the verses that we're about to read, they were written for a person who has drifted, a person who knows the truth, but hasn't grabbed on to the truth and made it their very own. You know the truth. You might even believe the truth in that sense, but you've never really acknowledged the truthfulness or its rightness in your own life. You see, I'm expecting a response. I'm expecting someone to respond to what I'm saying. I talked to a gentleman this last week, and he was talking about listening to preachers. And he said, you know, I get the feeling that they're trying to change my opinion. 
They're trying to change what I believe. I get the feeling, while the guy's up there and he was talking about a particular preacher, he says, while he was talking, he, don't you realize that I'm not going to change? And so if you're like that this morning, I've not given up on you and neither has God. But that this morning as we talk about not just hearing, but listening, and not just saying with our mouths, yes, I agree, or yes, that's truthfulness. No, to, in, to, to capture the truth. To take that which we know to be true and make it our very own is the message for this morning. I think you're well aware that the good news of Jesus Christ is that God's Son has entered into this world for the purpose of saving those who are on their way to hell. That everyone, when they're born into this world, are born a sinner without hope of heaven. And that sometime in their lifetime, they come to the point in which they realize that they're not right with God, and they realize that Jesus is God's Son who's offered to them eternal life, and they realize that God paid the price for their sin, and they realize the truth. And they embrace it, and they receive it as their very own. The Scripture, and the Apostle Paul specifically says it this way, he says that you are to believe in your heart, and then you are to confess with your mouth. And those individuals that confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that those individuals are the ones who are given the gift of eternal life. The tragedy is that there are countless thousands and maybe thousands of individuals within an arm's throw of this place that know that but have never received that message. Let's look here at this passage of Scripture in Hebrews, the second chapter, starting in verse number 1. We must pay, we must pay more careful attention. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what that we have heard. So that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received it's just punishment. How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. To know the truth is not enough. For the devil himself knows the truth, but fails to act upon that which he knows to be true. And because he fails to act upon that which he knows to be true, he rejects the truthfulness of God. Pray with me one more time. Father, as we open your word and as we expound upon this paragraph, May your Holy Spirit use these words to draw people to you. And my Father, not by the cleverness of men or by the, the cleverness of the message, but strictly by the wooing of your Holy Spirit, may we respond this morning. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I've said all along that right teaching demands a response. It doesn't really matter if we're teaching geometry or if we're teaching God's word. It demands a response. Now, if I were teaching geometry, there at the end of the section, I would probably give you what's called a quiz. And the response to that quiz would tell me if you've understood or taken in the truth that I've taught you. And many, many, many people will fail the quiz because they heard with their ear, but they didn't do the homework. They didn't do the assignments. And it becomes very telling to those who didn't do the homework. If I were teaching God's word, there is going to be a time in which the test will take place. And the test will be given as to whether or not you heard and received or if you heard only. And so, what have you heard is a question. In chapter number one of Hebrews, it states that Christ is superior to everything and everyone. He is exalted above all else. He is 
when I say the one, I capitalize the O because it identifies him as God. That he alone, and when I say he, I capitalize the H because he is God. He alone can forgive sin. He is the creator of all things. He created this world and everything in it, and he created you, and he created me, and he is worthy of our worship because he is God. And he personally gives an invitation to everyone who hears his message. What did Jesus say? Come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, eternal peace. I will give you a gift of rest, which is identified as eternal life. To one named Nick, he says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever received him would not perish but have, what? Eternal life. Come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And those that hear the words and those that respond to what they have heard receive the gift of eternal life. As an effective teacher, We've got to do more than simply present the facts. We've got to warn people. We've got to exhort people. We've got to invite people to come to receive and embrace the truth. I'm passionate about the truth. We wrote on the back of Virginia's license plate that that's what we're for. We're for truth. For Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we're for him. You remember last week I asked you, if somebody comes to you and they say, what are you for? Well, I want you to respond to that by saying, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm for Jesus. You know, we do a real good job of telling people what we're against. I mean, real good about telling people what we're not for. But we need to be a better example or a better communicator on what we're for. And we need to say, I'm for the truth. I'm for Jesus Christ. And I'm not satisfied by simply giving out the truth and letting you go on your way without responding to it in some way, I ask you to receive the truth, to believe the truth, to confess the truth. By longing for you to respond positively, I've asked you to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. For I believe that those who have not accepted Christ are those who have not believed in their heart, and they have not confessed with their mouth, and those individuals will never see heaven. God's word demands a response. And as a faithful teacher of God's word, I'm going to ask you for a response. The opening verses of Hebrews chapter 2 contain a warning. With all that you know, with all that's available to you, with everything that you have accumulated as to what God is and who God is and what he expects of you, it would be safe to say that we are without excuse. That we don't get to walk up to God on that day in which he says, why did you not receive me? And say, I didn't know. I didn't receive. I didn't accept it because there wasn't time or it wasn't communicated clearly enough or I just wasn't sure. I figured that I wasn't as bad as so and so. And we start offering excuses. Anyone that's taught anything has listened to people give you excuses, 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 excuses as to why. But there's no excuse. A person can know all the truth that there is to know about Jesus Christ and then go to hell. I remember back when I was a kid growing up and a friend of mine, we'd ride in a car and he was much older than I and he was trying to get me to, to listen to scripture and to listen to radio preachers. There was a guy on the radio that was named Oliver B. Green. And Oliver B. Green was an old-time Baptist preacher that preached hell, fire, and damnation on the radio. And at the end of his message, every single time, he would say, I want to offer a prayer. And I want to offer a prayer to the closest Baptist who's going to hell right now. Because, you see, in our minds, we say, well, I'm tagged. You know, I, I, I'm a Methodist, or I'm a Baptist, or I'm a Presbyterian, or I'm a Pentecostal, or I'm a something, and I'm a something, and I'm a something else. And we got it in our head that if we're tagged, that that's all that we've got to do. And you see, it's more than that. We, we don't just get tagged. We have to receive and accept and take 
that which we know. There's another warning here. It's found in verse number 3. And it's a, it's a warning to those who are intellectually convinced but yet haven't received or haven't acted upon the truth. You know, there are many warnings throughout the Bible to those who have already accepted Christ. There, there are those who have accepted Christ and they're warned not to grieve the Holy Spirit or, or they've accepted Christ and they're warned to, that they need to be living sacrifices holy and acceptable unto God. Uh, there are those that have accepted Christ and they're warned that they've got to uh, not live for themselves but they've got to be a disciple of God and they've got to take the message to the four corners of the earth and if they don't, they're not going to receive a reward. There are those that have accepted Christ and they're, 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 they're warned not to neglect the salvation in which they've been given. But this warning goes to those who are intellectually convinced, but they've not received. They, they have failed to embrace. Specifically here, this warning are to those that are the, from the Jewish descent. The first century Jews that saw Christ and they didn't follow him. And that's why this writer includes himself, we and us, as he identifies himself with his own people. And the message is not strictly, though, to those who are Jewish descent, but it's to anyone who is sitting there listening and deciding whether or not these things are true, and that at some point they say, I can't argue against it. I don't have enough information that causes me to argue against it. I, I'm, I'm kind of convinced that what that guy is saying, or I'm kind of convinced that what he read there is true, but I'm just not ready to act upon it. Most people don't wake up in the morning and go headlong intentionally into hell. You wouldn't deliberately do that. And most people that we come in contact with are not evil people who are striving to be against God. Most of the people that we come in contact with are not theologically but are good people. Now we know that theologically there is no, none that is good, not even one. And we know that, but, but basically what I'm saying here is most of the people that we come in contact with, they're not deliberately in the moment turning their backs on God. Most people just slowly slip past the harbor of salvation. They just sort of drift past it without seeing the danger that is in front of them. You see, in order to go to hell, all you've got to do is nothing. All you've got to do is nothing. In order to get to heaven, you have to do something, and what you have to do is receive the gift of eternal life. You say, well, you know, I've, I've done that, Don. I, I've accepted the gift of eternal life. Then don't neglect the salvation that's been given to you. It's a great gift from God. I think the second important reason for here that's, that's given that we need to grab onto is the fact that we know a lot about Christ. We know a lot about the facts that he died for our sin. I mean, after all, we came to church on Easter. We heard the message that, that Jesus died and was buried and he rose again. But most people say, what am I supposed to do with that information? And they basically sit there and they say, well, I categorize that over in this department of my, my brain called church or religion. And, and we, we put it over there and we store it away sort of like our multiplication tables. That's interesting information. It's sort of important, but I don't know how important it might be. And when I, when I run it into a case that it's really, really important, I'll pull it out of that segment of my brain and I'll plug it in and it'll work for me. Sorry. It doesn't work that way. You see, to go to hell means we do absolutely nothing. We haven't embraced it. Perhaps I'm describing somebody in our family. Perhaps maybe I'm describing a husband or a wife or a brother or a sister or a friend. Or maybe I'm describing someone that's here right now. I mean, you come to church, you hear and you hear and you hear and you hear and you know, and you know, and you know, and you pile up all this stuff about God, but there's never been really a time in which you've had to pull it out of that side of your brain and put it into practice, and so you think, well, it's just good enough to know. 
This warning goes to those individuals who have heard and haven't received. And verse number three and verse number four of that little passage that we read, I gave, there's, there's three reasons. Now there might be six, there might be 12, but you'll be real glad that I found three. Three reasons of why that we need to receive Christ as our Savior. The first reason is the character of Christ himself. The, the little word, therefore, the reason that we should pay attention is given in all of chapter number one, that Jesus is called the Son or the heir of all things, the creator of the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact representation of God. He is God in, in the flesh, as John said. He's the one that has come, and he's the anointed one. He was the one that was worshipped and served by angels. He was anointed above all others. He was the Lord of creation. It is Jesus who came into the world as God's incarnate, died on the cross to forgive sins, pay for our penalty, showed us divine love, and offered to introduce us to God as one of his children. It was Jesus, God's voice, and Jesus was God in this world. It was Jesus. And verse number one, on the basis of who Christ is, we must give careful attention to what we have heard about him. We cannot hear these things and let them just slide out of our minds. We don't, have, we don't want to drift away. We don't want to just flow by and departmentalize this and put it over in a part of our brain and some, someday that's going to be important and I'm going to pull it back out. Jesus is God who came in the flesh so that you could be introduced to God. The second important thing is found in verse number 2 and verse number 3. It, it deals with the certainty of judgment. We, because we don't get penalized immediately, we think that we got by. Because it's not immediate lightning. You've heard this expression, if I walk into the church, the door, the, the house will fall in. I mean, lightning will strike. You know, you've heard those little expressions. Because it doesn't happen, you think, well, I got by. But the idea here is that no one gets by God. There is a certainty of judgment. And the judgment for one particular sin is what it takes to send someone to hell. Not a multitude of sins, not a big sin versus a little sin, just one sin is what sends someone to hell. And you know what the sin that's spoken of here is? It's the sin of not receiving. The unpardonable sin, the sin that can't be forgiven, the sin that won't be forgiven, is the sin of not receiving Jesus as Savior and Lord. Two words are used here for sin. The word transgression and the word disobedience. Transgression means to step across the line as a willful act. It's sort of like that the day that I told my four-year-old that they couldn't go into the street. And we walked out to the edge of the driveway and we showed them the curb. And we said, this is the yellow area, this is the danger area, and this area on this side now is disobedience. That you cannot step into the street. And what did they do? They walked out there, they turned around and looked at me, and they took their foot, and they went like this, touch and back. To prove to me that they were going to be the boss, and they were going to do what they wanted to do. You've never had kids like that, have you? All of your kids just obey. They just, when, when, when you told them to do something, they just nodded and did without ever any question. No, not mine. Not mine. As soon as I made a rule, they immediately attempted to break the rule to prove that they were the boss. That's transgression. I won't tell you what I did to the little person who was four years old who did that deliberate act. But disobedience is a different idea altogether. Disobedience carries the idea of maybe imperfect hearing. Not like that of a deaf man that cannot hear, but disobedience here could be something that isn't such a deliberate act. It's a sin of neglect, a sin of omission. 
doing nothing when we know that we're supposed to do something. And the punishment is always related to light. For those who had the most light have the most severe punishment. But here's the point I want you to get. That we need to receive Jesus as our Savior because there is a certainty of judgment. And those individuals who know, and those individuals that have been intellectually convinced, those that have the message before them, and fail to act upon that which they know will have a more severe judgment than those who had no light whatsoever. The point is that no one gets by. No one slips under the radar. Every single one of us will stand before God and give an account to what we did with what we were given. And the number one thing that I want you to know that you're given right now is the message of the truth that Jesus came to save us from our sin. The third important reason for accepting Jesus is found in verse number four. It's called the confirmation from God. God testified that Jesus was his son. Three different times while he was here on this earth, he testified that Jesus was his son. I've identified them in the past. I'll do it real quickly. One was at the baptism. When God said, this is my beloved son, hear him. Once was at the Mount of Transfiguration when he is turned into the glory of God himself and Peter, James, and John, they immediately recognize this is God and we need to do something and they fall down to worship him and they hear the voice from God that this is my son, hear him. And the third time was at the cross. When Jesus preached the message, he preached the message that if you believe in me, you will be given eternal life. If you don't believe in me, that you will not be given eternal life. Kind of narrow-minded, isn't it? Kind of one-sided, isn't it? God testified that God, I am here showing you this is my son. Jesus testified that I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and indwelled the believers and they spoke in magnificent languages so that everyone that heard them heard the words and understood what they were saying. The gifts of God were distributed greatly amongst individuals that they would see and understand and know that Jesus is God's Son. Therefore, three great reasons why that you should receive Jesus as your Savior and not neglect the, the gospel or, or the good news, the character of God, the certainty of judgment, and the confirmation of God himself. God has attested to this gospel through the signs and wonders and the miracles that has been distributed amongst us, and now he, he attests that these things are true. And so I'm drawn to this one point. Don't let it be said of you that you neglected Jesus Christ. That you departmentalized him to this part in which someday it might be important. I'm telling you that it's important today. History tells us that the failure to shoot a rocket into the air at the precise time of night caused the fall of Holland during World War II. They missed the mark. They, they neglected the warning. It wasn't for another 22 years that they were delivered. Napoleon delayed at Waterloo for three hours. Three hours. It cost him the Battle of Waterloo. Neglecting Christ's salvation will cost you an eternal blessing, an eternal joy, and will bring you a damning judgment, an eternal punishment, and a separation from God for all of eternity. Don't drift past God's grace. Because of neglect. Abandonment, desertion, being unattentive, lacking the care that's needed to pay attention to this one truth, to ignore it, to overlook it, to disregard it, to avoid it, to allow it to pass over, is to neglect this great 
salvation. Would you pray with me this morning?